Don't let your cleverness, <laughs> don't let your excitement for this whatever new thing you're going to add in there. Don't forget about Bob, though, because Bob's your target audience. <laughs> now, if you need to now be targeting at Steve because the game has changed and it went from a 30 minute, you know, filler game to like a two hour you know, game night. Okay, that's fine. But be very intentional in going from Bob to Steve. Got to keep Bob. In, I'm going to change that that section to keep Bob in mind. I like keep <laughs> Bob in mind. Keep Don't forget Bob about Bob. Don't forget yes, about Bob. Because Bob's buying your game. Hopefully it moves Bob when he plays your game. He He's like, this was made for me. So Leo, you've got experience working with Hasbro, you've worked with some, some pretty big brands. You've worked with Clue, you've worked with D&D, you've worked with Risk. Like that's that's a pretty good pedigree as far as a resume is you know is concerned. But you've got this really cool gauntlet, you call it, where you basically determine your pillars of game design and you kind of plug an idea into all these different things. It's, it's pretty it's pretty big. And I'll, I'll link it to people down uh, below the show where they can kind of see it for themselves. But we're gonna, just going to dive into these pillars and dive into all the sub pillars. Cause that's the thing is it's like one big idea. And then like a whole bunch of subtopics <laughs> that really just kind of help you put the game in the box, so to speak, right? Figure out what are the constraints? Where do I want to go? What do I want to do? So before we get into it, you know, in more detail, tell me exactly like your thoughts, like what is this thing that you created to help you design games? And then also like, why, why did you create this as opposed to just sitting down and seeing what happens and let the, let the game design just kind of flow from you. Like, why get more technical with this kind of document? Yeah, of course. Well, thanks for having me, Gabe. Um, huge fan of the podcast. Thanks for having me on. I um, So the Pillars of Design started when I started listening to things like this podcast, reading books, learning, like, you know, how it goes. It's a multi-class kind of focus, game design. And so I was like, man, I'm going to forget half these things. I'm notoriously, you know, not great memory. So I just want to start documenting them. And then I realized at some point, oh, this is kind of a, like, like you said, a gauntlet, like this is a good thing to think of before I start going into deep design work. Um, so let's say I'm, I'm working on a game. I'm thinking, oh, this theme would work really well. Um, maybe I have like a noodling of like where to start, but actually I think I'm ready to develop. Let's go ahead and like do a checklist almost like um, kind of like not only how many players, that kind of thing, but also think of it from like different angles. Like what's the narrative? What's the theme? How are you going to market it? And it's not really to stifle your creativity. It's just to kind of help you get a full picture to kind of get those nodes in your brain connected before you start going into design. I also find it very comforting to set those constraints because then I don't go off in the weeds, which I'm also notorious for doing. I'll think as, as you guys probably all do, it's like, ooh, this mechanic, but what if I added this other mechanic? And so this is a way to keep you in the box um, and just have kind of a target that you're aiming for. The second part is if you ever get lost in your design, let's say it's, you know, you're in development and you're like, what was I doing? Should we change this to this rule A or B? You can always look back at the document and say, well, if we want to make it a family lightweight party game, then that chooses for me. I don't need to, you know, waste too much time thinking which mechanic to go with. It's like, oh, there's the there's the target. So it's kind of just a way to keep yourself honest. Um, and it's also not a like, you have to do everything on the checklist. It's I will typically go through these, um, I'm going to skim and kind of like, I can answer that question right now. That one, I don't know. I can answer that one. Um, so I apologize the document that's a lot going on, but that's my document. You know, like I, I encourage everyone to make their own because the process is different, but yeah. And that's one thing I've really been thinking about lately is, is not, Hey, you should do this. Instead it's, Hey, I did this and this is what worked for me. Your mileage may vary, but here's the systems and ideas that, that I kind of figured out. Uh, here's the evidence in my own designing, my own publishing, my own crowdfunding journey uh, of what works and what doesn't. And then ho hopefully other people can learn from it, right? And they can take some things away, but it's not theory, right? You are actively using this document to create games that have sold in the, you know, in the marketplace, right? Like I said, you, you've worked on uh, Clue and D&D, &D, like you've worked on these big brands, right? You've made escape rooms for Clue. Like a Clue escape room is a brilliant idea that I'm so excited that it exists, but it's like when, when you hear that though, you're like, well, of course that exists. Like, well, that's a, that, that just makes sense. And so we can use these games. I want, I want you to help kind of structure some of these ideas using the games that are on the market, right? That way people can kind of really get a, a real sense of how this document then translates into a product, right? And as we just kind of go through these things, feel free to share any stories, anecdotes uh, about the process along the way. And I think the best thing to do is just kind of go through the highlights, the pillars on the document, and then dive into any of the subtopics. We don't have time to do it all because this thing is <laughs> massive. And I like I like that it has lots of options, right? But to your point, it's not for someone just to copy paste and say, oh, I'm going to do that too. It's like, no, look at this, figure out what works for you. 
someone might have totally different ideas, you know, based on the kind of games that they're wanting to design or publish or bring out into the marketplace. And so, yeah, let's just kind of, let's just kind of dive into, oh, another thing I wrote down while you were talking is uh, this document creates a decision filter. And that's one thing I talk to new designers, especially you've got to constrain yourself. If anything is possible, nothing is going to get done because you, you just, it's, it's too open-ended. Right. And so creating a document like this, even if it's much simpler, right. Even if it's just like a handful of bullet points on the front end of like what kind of game you're wanting to make, those bullet points will help you have a decision filter so that anytime, like you, like you said, if you want to change the mechanism, if you want to do something thematically, well, you just look at that filter and then you just process everything through it. And you're like, no, nah, that doesn't make sense. Cause here's what I'm trying to, trying to accomplish. Right. Cause if you don't I have that, seen. it's just like, mm, what, let's do everything. What's well, like, you're never going to get anything. Well, I find that for me, I love to, I love designing around theme and kind of making sure the motions match the mechanics. That kind of thing is important to me. So I feel like you're juggling a lot of different mindsets at once. So this at least helps you kind of at least jar those like, you know, it's like, okay, I'm thinking very mechanically right now, but at least let me look at this document. Oh, right. Narrative. And it kind of just helps jog your memory to like, keep these things in mind um, as well, which is kind of fun. Yeah. It's great to refocus. Also, I can see the benefit of like, maybe you hadn't worked on the game in six months or a year. You can come back to this document and go, oh yeah, here are all the things that I'm trying to do. And it's not just like sporadic notes that you wrote down during play tests. It's like very specific <laughs> answers to questions and on the checklist. Like that's gotta be super helpful when you're coming back to a design. You gotta love those scrawled notes on the back of rules that you're like, I can't even read this. What did I say? Right. In the play? right. You're what shorthand. You're like, I don't even know what this means. Yeah. So the first one is experience, which I love because that's, that's where I begin. I, I'm thinking through what experience do I want to create for players? So let me ask you this. Is this a hierarchy? Like is experience first on purpose or is it just kind of <laughs> random? Okay. So I have to admit it is a, a bit of a um, brick by brick over the years. I've added chunks to it and they, I haven't put them in a perfect order. I don't know if there is such a thing, um, but I find this, this system of going through from the top to bottom for me useful right now. But every now and then I will purposely take a chunk of it and move it around just because I don't want to get locked into like, oh, I always think how many players first, then I do this. Um, so to keep it kind of fresh, but I think experience is a, is a good place to start as well. I'm also a very experiential designer first. So I like this one. Yeah. So a couple of questions in there are one is how does it end? Which I think, you know, begin with the end in mind is one of the most like old school business pieces of advice in the world. But I think for game design is great too, because you know, how does the game end? How do you win? Like, what are the things that are going to bring this experience to a close? If you know that early, it can help make a lot of decisions as far as like, what are the, what are the things pointing to that? You know, how do the rounds work? Are we drawing cards, rolling dice, all these things? Yeah, but why? Oh, because they lead to this end game state. Oh, okay. That makes a lot more sense. So I think that's, that's super smart. I was, when I read rule books, I have, I have my favorite types of rule books. The ones that give you a premise. Who are you? What are you doing narratively? How do you win? And I like that because it, it kind of, uh, it's a little bit clearer. I don't know. I like, I think it's just clear for me to get context of what you're doing. So, you know, why is, why not design that way too? I also think in mind, like how does in could also be a like moment, like, oh, does the family throw their hands up in the air and go, ah, we, that was a close one. You know, it's kind of like noodlings of moments of just kind of interaction. Uh, so it could kind of be that if you wanted to be mechanics, how does it end? How do you win? But also how does it like, what's the climactic you know, moment of the game. What are you kind of looking to build towards? I had a really great conversation with Jeff Engelstein recently, and we were talking about design theory. And that's one of the main things we talked about was understanding these moments in your game. And, and the ending is so vital because that's, that's what people are mainly going to remember. And so if the ending just kind of goes out with a whimper, right. And the best part of the game was in the middle. Well, people aren't going to remember the middle as much as they remember the end. Right. So even if the middle is amazing, if the end was like, meh, they're going to think the game was like, ah, eh, it's just okay you know, versus the, the other way around. Uh, and another thing you have in there is what peak experience are you trying to create? So again, what are these moments? So talk to me about some of, the, some of those moments, like for your own games, right? With these escape room games, with the risk, which is like the risk game is super cool because it's like a card game version of risk, risk strike, right? Where you're trying to take this massive board game experience that people have been playing forever and condense it down into a card game experience, which is no small task, right? So using maybe some of the games you've worked on, Help me to understand how you would apply the, this pillar of these questions to one of those games. So with Risk, luckily, uh, that's one of my personal favorite designs because it is, I loved Risk growing up and I was like, I don't have time to play a full game of Risk. So let's espresso shot it. How can you get an espresso shot for like the modern kind of, you know, time limits you have? 
Um, so that one, it was actually, their blueprint was already existed because you could go to risk. You could be like, how does it feel to play risk? What are the big moments? There's the dice moment where you have your big troops, you know, and you're fighting against your friend and you guys are both kind of mad at each other. And you're like, well, let's do this final battle. And we roll the dice. And there's kind of that moment of like, ah, I win or I, or I got you through the dice rolling. And so that is not a complicated moment, but that is a very crucial moment to the risk DNA of dice rolling and kind of like just beating you through luck, kind of like chance. And so for the risk strike, that, that was a must. You had to have dice. You had to have the same kind of like, ah, I got you. Um, I'm a little proud that we've added a little extra layer. There are some like tactics cards you can play to like kind of, oh, I got you, but then, you know, re-roll your dice. Um, so that's kind of an example in that system of a peak moment. If like you need that risk, throw your hands up in the air, uh, you roll better than me moment. Um, now for the Clue Escape series, it's the aha of solving it. So in Clue, once again, luckily enough, we had a great brand to work with, the IP. So we could just look at those games under a magnifying glass and be like, what are, what are the best moments? And so for that one, it was very much of, I, I'm, I've solved the mystery, I'm smart, aha. And so that's kind of what we needed to replicate in our Escape and Solve series. And so you do do puzzles, there's little ahas as you solve puzzles, but there's a big final puzzle you'd have to solve, which is the, the murder or the mystery of the box. And uh, so that's something just to keep in mind. And I once again, like if I was writing the document, it might not even be that involved. I might just literally write like, have aha moment. <laughs> like that's the, we got to hit that or have like, throw your hands in the air. That's the peak experience. You've defeated your friend um, kind of thing. So that's really cool. I'm, I've been working on a game called Robomon forever and it's a long game and it, it just kind of plays out over the course of lots and lots and lots of sessions. And so thinking through these moments, but also thinking through, you know, I want, I want them to happen at certain points in the story one, to reward the players, but to have those moments, right, where they're not just kind of grinding it out and trying to get through it. It's like where the game changes slightly, not massively necessarily, but, you know, you open up a new box or you get some new cars or new dice or new something. And and the game has a moment where the player had to sit back and go, huh, okay, the game, <laughs> the game has changed, right? And now it's new information, but they can kind of grow into it. Because if it's one of the things, like if you put all these things on the player at the beginning to learn it in the rule book or whatever, like it's just overwhelming. But to have these moments along the way where the game changes in some way, uh, Dominion is great at this, right? One, one of the best things about Dominion is you have to figure out when to switch gears and stop buying cards that, that do things and start buying cards that get you victory points because that's how you're going to win. And when do you do that? Small World, great example as well. Like when do you put that uh, civilization into decline and get a new <laughs> civilization? Like ah, that's a big moment where the game changes. The shift. Yeah, so it doesn't even have to necessarily be I guess what I'm saying is it could be narrative driven or it could be mechanically driven, but like the moments, you know, like you're saying, like where you stand up, and you're going to roll those dice. That's a cool thing to, to design for and think about. And it actually leads into the next pillar, which is moment design. So one, tell me how those things are a little bit different. And then tell me what you're thinking as far as like, how do you design a moment? So uh, moment design is actually, there is a power of moments book I read. It's a great book. I'd recommend it. I can pull up actually who wrote it. Let's see here looks like uh, Chip and Heath. It's a kind of a more, you know, it's not really game design focused per se, but I found it really useful because they actually broke down the science of what you need to have a peak moment, like a moment you would remember years from now. What are the like elements? What is the moment is kind of their way of saying like, where are you playing the game? Is it a birthday party? Is it a friend's house? Uh, is it a game night that you always go to? Um, see if it's a like, I guess they say like alert to key transition points. This would be like birthdays or anything that's like, a shift uh, because they found that in like kind of in science that like when you're kind of like when you're in shift of a change you you typically remember that a little more now i don't know if you can really do this all in a board game because usually you, you meet up with your friends you play board games there's nothing like too groundbreaking like you're not playing in an apocalypse you know like everything's falling apart or anything um but i think where it actually starts getting useful is the break the script um you've probably already kind of heard this but in, in this framework it's basically just what are games in the same genre doing and what is their current DNA? So like social deduction, you know, there's always the kind of like, we have hidden roles, we have uh, accusations and distrust. Um, and then how, after you've like analyzed what the current script is, how can you break it? Um, so what's the twist? And that actually works really fun from a gameplay perspective, but more even fun from a like hook, like, let's say, I don't know, um, you have, 
it's werewolf, but you play it underwater. <laughs> of course, that game might not work, but people might at least per perk their ears up and be like, oh, okay, I've never heard of that. I'd try it. <laughs> it's it's werewolf, but you spray each other with, with water guns, you know, that kind of thing. That, that also sounds like it's a game, potentially it's a game's hook, right? What's going to get people to lean in and go, oh, tell me more. Or if it's, you know, sitting on a shelf somewhere or sitting on you know, Kickstarter that you have this soundbite basically that says it's werewolf, but underwater, like, oh, oh, what? what? How's that work? And now people want to like click and they want to, you know, turn, turn the box over and look at the back and read the copy, that kind of thing. So that makes sense as well from a product design as much as it does from a just game design space. And then also too, there's just like things that I find like raise the stakes is usually in most games. Uh, it's like, what's your objective? What's going to heighten the tension? Um, you know, are you competing? Uh, and then boost sensory appeal is actually one of my favorites from the book is this book doesn't really talk about game design, but it's like translating it to game development. How does it work? Sensory appeal seems very much aligned with board games. Like the reason I play them is because it's like, it feels cool. These pieces are nice. Um, I just overall delightful to play this like beautiful work of art. And so thinking of like, what are your pieces like and how does, how do you interact with the game and how does it feel is kind of a fun, just question to ask yourself. Um, yeah. Also how Instagrammable is it? Sure. <laughs> right. And how many, how many <laughs> TikToks thinking. can you get people? <laughs> Definitely. Right. I mean, it just is what it is, right? How, how can you help yourself from the marketing standpoint, right? With the visual sensory appeals, um, if you think about party games, they party games are so easy to put on TikTok because they're silly and goofy and people are doing them, you know, doing funny things, right? And that lends itself to a, a sixty second clip. And so, just thinking th thinking through that, because again, we're not just designing games here; we're designing products, right? So it's something else to to think about. It's all this stuff kind of coming together uh, more than just, hey, I've got this passion project to design a, a twelve hour, you know, space epic. Like, yeah, but is that going to be a, a product on the marketplace? Because you know, if you don't care. All good. Not saying you have to, not saying you got to worry about it, but it is something to, these are things to think about if you do want to come to market. Yeah. I also, um, this is probably a random side tangent, but I think very much about being a game designer myself. Uh, there's nothing wrong with, like you said, space epic, if you're designing that, but if you decided to design a game, um, that's your thing and you want to run with that, like, that's awesome. Uh, but I think for this, this checklist is always like, I want to be a better game designer and I want to design lots of different games. So I do keep that in mind as far as just like, I don't know, one of my own personal goals, like, oh, I want to be a better designer. I don't. Uh, so a lot of these questions I feel like are kind of so that you can put a lot of designs through it. Uh, of course, if you have your own, you know, big ass game, it's like you can, you don't really need to have pillars per se, because you can set those along the way of your journey. I wouldn't recommend it though, for like selling, like you said, it might be tough to sell, but. I like one of these next ones, players finding aha moments. I think that's a cool thing, either narratively, when there's a, a sudden change in the story, right? All of a sudden you find that Bob is, is a traitor. You know, that's a cool moment. Betrayal in House on the Hill is excellent for this. Like when now we go into the second phase of the game and somebody has to leave the room and read a different rule book and they're going to come back and we're we're all now, it's we're against them or are we? Are they against? Like we don't know you know these kind of aha moments narratively. But then also mechanically, when a game clicks, right? When you've been playing for a few rounds and you go, oh, that's how this thing works. And the game now changes because I have a, a deeper insight into it. I think that's, that's really cool. Uh, do you have any moments where you've kind of like designed for those moments? So we have, um, this is a project that's really kind of in development. It's not finished and published, but there's a kind of a deck builder we're working on. And a moment we really wanted for aha is that, um, like, like you said, it's kind of like mechanically, as you build your deck, you are discovering what you could do for the next game. You're like, oh, I built my deck wrong and, or I built my deck this way this time, but if I was to do it, you know, like, oh, that card, if I added that in, I think that kind of thing is really fun as well. So not only narrative, like emotional moments, but like, like you said, gameplay, like, oh man, I want to play again because I actually want to build this differently or play a different strategy. Um, so I think that's also really fun. Yeah. I think it's so important as designers to make it somewhat easy for players to realize why they won or why they lost. Right. If players get to the end of the game and they got decimated, right, they lost by 50 points that they go, well, it's because I made this decision. I built my deck like this. I tried this risky thing over here and it didn't work out. But I can at least point to myself and go, I'm the reason versus, you know, I just had a bunch of bad die rolls and the, the dice gods were against me tonight. I mean, we're probably going to blame the dice gods anyway. But yeah. for players to be able to go, here's why I won. Here's why I lost. I think that's super, super helpful, especially for getting people to play again. 
Because if I have no idea, I'm like, I don't understand this game. I might think, eh, this game's just not for me. I don't want to play it again. Versus, oh, I see what I should have changed about my strategy mid-game. Next time we play, I'm going to get you because now I understand it. Like that's a, it just seems to be a better, better game experience. The add insight and the aha moment is, is once again, something to keep in mind, uh, just why you design. I don't know if you can always like start off and be like, this is how I will design that moment. But it's nice to just think about like, oh, what will keep players wanting to play it again? Or what what's going to be there like tripping over the fun that they find during play? Yeah, I think it can also just be, like you're saying, an idea. Like, I'll give you an example. Um, when Eric Lang and Rob Davio were working on Death May Die, Eric Lang, he, I heard him say this in an interview. He said, when we started the game, my idea was, wouldn't it be cool if you could shoot Cthulhu in the face with a shotgun? <laughs> That'd be cool. That's a cool moment. How do we design for that? Right. And he had no mechanisms. He had no narrative. There was no nothing other than, I want to create this experience for the players where they feel like they can do that. Versus most Cthulhu games, which is like, you're slowly going to go insane and you're just going to kind of see what happens. You know, you can't really do a whole lot to fight these things, but like, what if you could? You know, and so I think that's a cool experience to start from. And so even if you're coming at it from like very, very basic out there in the ether, kind of an idea of, okay, I want to be able to do this cool thing. I don't know how, how I'm going to do it or how it's going to work or how players are going to accomplish that dice cards. I don't, I don't know but I'm aiming at this. I think that's at least a good place to start. That's cool. And it's also kind of a design hook for yourself in a weird way of like, I've broke the script through, it's Cthulhu, but instead of you being scared, you can shoot him in the face. So it's kind of a fun, like, not only does it work as a sell point, it actually works to inspire you to hopefully, you know, figure out what the mechanics are. Um, the next one is called like Add Pride, by the way. It's just kind of, this one's a little more, I don't know if it really for, you know translates really well to game design, but it's mostly like, why would people be invested in, in their milestones? And in games, we typically have like objectives. So it kind of naturally fits like, oh, you want to win. Um, or if, you know, if it's not win, maybe in a party game, like you have the pride of your team has selected your correct word, you know, like in Taboo or something. Um, so adding those like, like, like little moments of pride that you feel when you play the game is kind of fun to think about. Um, but typically I find that this section I usually do kind of skip quicker because it's like, okay, the game has an objective. So your pride is around usually your winning and or competing or cooperating with your friends. You can also do this mechanically um, or, or at least you definitely can with legacy games. So Risk Legacy comes to mind where every time a player wins, they get to mark that on the board. Right. And then the winner gets to, to do something. You get to add a sticker. You get to make a city different. You get to change some numbers somewhere. And so you kind of get that moment of like, oh man, I get to do this thing. Um, but you can also do it mechanically in the game. Like I've seen some games where, you know, the person in last place or person in first place, they get this extra little thing that they get to do. So, you know, that's not like, oh, look at me, I'm great. But like, even in the moment in a very small way, you can kind of get some little extra bonus or benefit for being in a certain position. And so just kind of add, add pride in there, right? Um, it's just different things. To, I guess main thing is just different things to think about as far as creating these these moments. That's kind of a fun one. I thought like just naming a card, um, like I said, legacy, like signing your name on something actually goes a long way of being like, cool, I have a little hit of like, that's that's fun. That's, I'm, pr I'm proud, that's my card, or that's my, you know, like I said, the sticker. Moving into the, the next one, design inspirations. This is one I like to do. I like to list out the games that I'm thinking about. This isn't really helpful later. If I come back to it six months later, I'm like, what was what was that game about the thing where you did the other stuff? Like, I can't even remember, but if I write it all down, it's more helpful. Or if I saw a game review or a playthrough video or something like that, I'll put the link, you know, that makes it everything easy to find. But to just to go through and go, here are the games that are inspiring this. How can I do things similarly? How can I do things differently so it stands out? You know, their hook is this. So my hook is going to be that. But that's super, super helpful. So tell me, you know, you've, you've worked on a lot of games where you, the inspiration was literally in the name. Clue, the escape game, right? D&D &D escape game. Um, Risk, like you're starting off with some pretty well-known brands, which is nice, but also maybe more constraining than, you know, other opportunities. But tell me about this, as far as your design inspirations, how do you handle this particular? Sure. So I, I find that like, let's say I'm working on a game that's not IP, it's kind of just a game I'm thinking of. It's, uh, you know, random. I will, I will think about what did I, what, I, I think a lot of nodes, like, I don't know why I think of them as circular dots that I have in my life that I've experienced, you know, like this little experience or this song I listen to and, and somehow in my brain they'll connect and then I'll be like, oh, that's a cool game idea. So it's really just taking stock of like, kind of reflecting back of like, what did I have to make me want to make this game? 
So for example, let's say I'm making an alien game. I watched the movie Alien, that's one node. What other experiences did I have that's like, oh, I also saw this cool color palette online that was like very bright and maybe I wanna make a bright alien game. Um, of course, this is all fictional. I'm just making something up, but it's more just like thinking back like, oh, I played this other game. It made me feel, I really liked how that mechanic worked or how uh, the game kind of actually made me kind of feel different. And so it's really just like, I'll write out um, kind of like what I've experienced. And that just, I don't know why that just helps me kind of almost like get more awareness of why I'm choosing the things I'm choosing and also call upon those experiences for inspiration later. Let's say I get lost in the weeds. I'm confused on what part of the game I should work on. I can look back at these and be like, oh yeah, let's, let me go watch the alien movie. Maybe that'll help. Like <laughs> kind of like pull on those uh, like DNA of where it started. Yeah, that makes sense. It's also like a, for a, for a sports metaphor, it's like watching film. Right. If you if you have something you want to do or you want to get better at or you want to understand, well, you just break down the film. Right. OK. They, you know, you find people doing it well and they go, OK, they, they take their first step this far out. They're lined up here. They move this way. OK, how can I recreate that myself? That way I can be really good at this technique or whatever it is as well. Same thing with game design. Right. If you can break down a game mechanically, narratively, productly, whatever, marketing, all those things and go, okay, here is the thing that I think is really cool. Why is it working? How did this sell a million? How did this make a million dollars on Kickstarter? Like how in the world did they do this? Okay, let's break it down. Okay. Well, they had this email list. They, they had eight months leading up to the campaign. Like you start breaking down the steps and all of a sudden it gets a little more interesting, first of all, but a little easier to actually recreate it because you're breaking it down. So I think this makes a lot of sense. And like I said, it's, it's always nice to be able to go back uh, later and remember Oh yeah, that, that inspired me. Let me go look at that video again. Let me go watch that movie again. And I'll probably get that same inspiration happening. Right. Like sometimes if I watch, let's say I make a theme park game, I watched a cool like roller coaster documentary. I'll link the, like the documentary link there just in case you never know. You're like, you know what? I'm feeling like I'm kind of lost in the weeds. Let me just watch this. And I'm like, oh, I kind of feel the like, you know, initial thoughts of like, oh, that's a cool video. Let me see if I can, you know, get inspired to put it in my game. Um, the other thing I really like under this list of these other questions is, what experiences could you have to help you with this project? And so that's almost like, what are steps you could take if you feel like you want to kind of go further into research? Um, so let's say with the roller coaster example, I could go to a theme park. Let's say I actually haven't gone to the theme park nearby, like the Six Flags or whatever, but maybe I could write that on there. And if I ever feel like, you know, up for it, and I want to get inspired. It's kind of just a nice little checklist of like, play a theme park video game. Um, you know, look at some, look at some pictures or learn about the mechanics of how they build rides. Um, but I really like that one. I use that one a lot as far as like trying to think through, think ahead. Uh, what can I do to really help me research this, this style of kind of project? Yeah, that makes sense. It reminds me of my conversation I had a while back with Martin Wallace and whenever he's working on a game, he just immerses himself in everything he can find books, documentaries, movies, everything. One to make sure he has a good handle on kind of like what he's doing. So in your example, like the roller coaster game. So he'd go out and read every roller coaster book he could find. He'd look at all the diagrams and the blueprints and all the engineering and all that kind of stuff. One to, to say, okay, here is like the truth, right? Here is an actual factual based game about roller coasters. It's still a game. We're going to have some extra abstractions and some fun things, but here's as close as I can get it. But also when you immerse yourself, you start finding some really interesting ways to bring that thing to life. And these little like minutia Things, you know, things that a lot of people maybe don't even notice or they don't even recognize, but all of a sudden you start talking to an expert and or especially someone who like gets really excited about the thing. You're like, oh, let me tell you about all these tiny little details you've never noticed. Like all of a sudden you can make your game more interesting, more real, more fun. So I think that's it's a really good thing just to, to think about. If you have an idea for a game, go as deep as you can into that topic because you're going to find these little nuggets of wisdom, nuggets of gold that you can kind of bring to life in your game experience. Totally agree. I think it's uh, really fun to get in. I think it is interesting how someone who gets excited about a thing is is interesting. Even if I'm like, I, I didn't know I love roller coaster design until we were standing in line at a theme park with a friend. And she was like, I read all these, these, did you know that they use these rivets and these, and the way they build it? And I was like, huh, I'm now, it, that sounds awesome. I kind of want to go read that. It's like you catch the fire of their excitement. And so I feel like kind of doing that for yourself helps. It's just like, oh, let me go get, you know, kind of catch that fire. Um, and then use that and try to convert it into my game design to get all kind of maybe hopefully there's like a through line. And then at the end of the day, when people play it, they feel the same feeling you kind of did. Yeah, absolutely. There's a, a book by Donald Miller came out years ago called Blue Light Jazz. And part of that book is this, this like realization 
Uh, and he talks about jazz. He's like, I didn't like jazz until I heard someone who loved it and was good at it playing it. And that changed it for me. And I was like, oh man, Senator, really, how do you apply that in other parts of your life? And then how can we kind of be conduits for other people, right? Um, to help them in, in life in general, right? But especially in, in our topic here, it's like bringing them into the gaming space. How do you do that as a designer? Just just things to think about. Those moments at the table where players are going to interact and like you want it to feel good. You know, so how do we do that effectively? But um, yeah, just things. Again, these are all just things to be thinking about. You don't have to like sit down and write a, a doctor level th thesis on like all these things for your game, but just things to be aware of, things to be uh, thinking about as you as you design. And so all right, let's go to the next one, design vision, which I... I would probably put this one first in, in my head, right? As far as like, who are the players? Where are they? What are they doing? Like all these kinds of things. So tell me the stuff you typically write down with your design vision. Is it, is it something you start off with as well? Or tell me about it. I do typically start with someone in mind. Uh, like I said, there's like different ways to think about it, like an avatar, or a person or a kind of a market, uh, whatever you call it. I like to think of a very specific person. Um, so for example, uh, this is actually my first game is cave game. It turned into galaxy gold mine. I actually thought of my mom a lot. I was like, could my mother play this? Would she enjoy this? Cause that was kind of the target audience. I wanted to have like a family game. Um, and so it was funny cause I just kind of, I kind of thought of her as like the target to, to think on, but actually to stay, take a step back, the design visual visualize, uh, thing is I typically will actually kind of close my eyes and just try to think build the game out in my head and like, what are the people around the table look like? Wh who are they? Uh, what kind of moments? What are the looks on their faces? Is it a very thinky war game? And they're kind of smiling with the smirk of like, okay, I'm about to do this cool move, but it's going to take four turns. Or is it a very fast, frantic party game where everyone's yelling and it's just like around a couch? Um, I find it just useful just to kind of see, it's almost like you're, you're checking in with yourself, like how much clarity do I have around this vision of a game? Um, is it very clear? Is there things that are fuzzy? Um, I just find it like a fun, useful thing, but I, I think like to your point, I, I typically do start here, um, in one way or another, this is more just like the stop on my like list of like, take a second and actually just close your eyes and try to do this little process as silly as it probably feels. It works really well, I think. Yeah. Well, again, it gets back into the whole, like begin with the end in mind. And if you really think through who is this game for, you know, if I'm designing a game for eight year olds. It's going to be a 10 minute game, 15 minute game. Like that's, if that's the kit, the, the group of people I'm envisioning in my mind for this game, it's going to change a whole lot about the design space. Right. And so if you can write, kind of really envision who the game's for, the moments they're going to have, like that's going to determine a whole lot of other stuff, whether it's the player count, the play time, how deep and complicated the mechanisms can be the price point. Right. So if I'm thinking, okay, this is going to be a, a 20 minute family game, it, it can't cost a hundred dollars. Right. And so now my component, you know, filter is, is going to be different than if I'm designing some kind of big Epic space opera, that's going to take two and a half hours to play. Well, okay. That could be a hundred bucks and have a bunch of really cool miniatures and this big board and all these different cards. So anyway, a lot of this stuff just helps you again, back with that decision filter. And the earlier you can get some of these things figured out, the quicker I think you can get to the actual game that you're trying to, to create. Right. And also I have a lot of, repeating questions during this whole document. And so Tom, sometimes it's just useful to just kind of keep checking in with myself. Like you're making a game for someone. Uh, I think of myself like kind of a, you know, you design experiences and you're giving it to somebody. Who is that somebody you're trying to give it to? Cause like I said, that'll determine your design, but it also keeps you, keeps me honest. Cause sometimes, you know, I like to theorize like this mechanics neat. Let me just make a game around it. But I don't actually have a, like, what am I doing? I'm just mostly, you know, playing around with mechanics. Um, so it's nice to just kind of keep reiterating, like, what are you, who is this for? Who are you going to give this to? And who is it, who will enjoy this the best? I, I find that really nice to just keep checking in. Be clear more than clever. Is a lot, so I have to always sure. tell myself, yeah. you know, it's like, oh, this is so cool. Yeah, but it's going to take two and a half pages in the rule book to, de to describe, is it worth it? You know, are you, is it worth that much real estate? Is it worth that much cognitive load for me as a designer just to feel clever and say, hey, look how cool, look how good of a designer I am, you know, versus just cutting that and actually the game doesn't suffer. If anything, the game got better because I cut that part, right? <laughs> Which can hurt. It can hurt your ego a little bit. But to your point, it's like if you create, whenever you create this customer avatar, right, you've got Bob and Bob is this kind of a gamer and he likes this amount of time and he you know, has this much time to play a game, whatever it is, right? Don't forget about Bob. Don't let your cleverness, <laughs> don't let your excitement for this, whatever new thing you're going to add in there, 
don't forget about Bob though, because Bob's your target audience. <laughs> now, if you need to, to now be targeting at Steve, because the game has changed and it went from a 30 minute, you know, filler game to like a two hour you know, game night. Okay. That's fine. But be very intentional in going from Bob to Steve. And so that's, that's just normal business kind of stuff and something you, you think Bob about. In, I'm going to change that, that section to keep Bob in mind. I like keep that. Bob in mind. Keep don't forget Bob about Bob. Don't forget yes. about Bob. Because Bob's buying your game. You know, it's like, don't forget about the, the person that hopefully, you're aiming this whole thing. Hopefully at. it moves and, Bob when he plays your game. He He's like, this was made for me. It's what you want. It's better. I, th- I think I've said this several times recently on the podcast, but it's better to be someone's favorite game. And also, you know, people's, the game they, don't, they never, never want to see again versus everybody's meh, you know. Better to be a five star and a one star than a whole bunch of threes, because there's no, there's actually no money in the middle. There's money in, you know, when you're someone's favorite. So, how do you how do you design a game that's going to be Bob's favorite? Now, are you always going to get there? No, right. It's it's kind of like catching lightning in a bottle. But at least if you're aiming at it, right, and you're leaning into it and thinking, the difference between going, okay, this is good, it you know it's it's going to be fine. People in general are going to think this is good versus people are going to love this and then some people are going to hate it. I think that's a better place to design, right? Especially from the, the marketing side. Yeah, I think it's it's the most fulfilling when you hear someone who's like, man, I had the moment, you know, you watch play tests and you're like, they're having the moment I'm intending them to have. That's kind of a magical moment. But of course, that moment you're designing is not for everyone. So it's nice to, like you said, like, I don't think you can, you know, you can't force everyone to be moved by an alien movie. I personally was, I was like, oh, this is a cool movie. But, you know, I, it's like, try to design the moment the best you can and know who it's for. But ultimately, you're not going to hit everyone's going to not going to be moved by your, your your specific design. And you don't want them to be. You know, I, I think about like my favorite books over there on the shelf, my favorite games of all time. All of those have one star reviews on Amazon. They all have ones on Board Game Geek, you know, where people are like, oh, this is not for me. I hated it. It's like, oh, but I loved it. It was like one of the best experiences I ever had. And so I think I think that's just a better place to to design for. All right. So design motivations. All right. Tell me about this. Is this more personal, right? Is this kind of more deeper and existential as far as your own like designer motivations? Yes. So it, in a nutshell, it's kind of an ego check. Um, like you said, you being clever versus creating something. It's mostly just like what started, why do you want to design this? Is it because you want to experiment with a mechanic and try to be a better designer by getting your chops, you know, with this like thing? Is it because you need to make money? Is it like, it's mostly just trying to be honest with yourself and be like, what am I trying to do by designing this game? There's no wrong or right answer. It's just checking in with yourself. Um, And so it's nice to know if you're just experimenting like, oh, this game, I just want to play around with this. Like, could I add this really complicated mechanic and will it work? Um, Because maybe it's not meant to be a product you're trying to sell. Maybe it's just supposed to be an exercise. Um, So it's just a nice check in, see what's going on. Um, once again, I have who, who is this for again? <laughs> I have it probably in every section. I don't know why I keep copying and pasting that one, but, um, cause you don't want to forget fav- Bob. Right, right. Don't forget Bob. <laughs> um, I think my favorite is why does it need to be a physical game? Um, coming from a little bit of the video game industry, there's lots of media you could do to create an experience. Uh, like we did escape room design and video games and there's apps and there's all these things. Um, something I keep in mind is like the medium of board game design is kind of magical. And why does it need to be people in a room, physical pieces? Um, And maybe you can't always answer that, but it's a nice way to start thinking, okay, so I have a game has, I'm thinking it might have an app, but could I delete the app and make it more social interaction? Would that make it more reason to be a physical game? Uh, Another question I like to ask is like, why can't this just be an app? Like, does the game I make just a better version of an app? Because you know how there's many complicated games out there that might be better off for just being like, instead of having a bajillion pieces, I'd rather just be digital so I could just, you know, play smooth. Um, it usually always goes around, why are people face-to-face, though? I think that's more important to me. Like, what what can the game, how can the people playing the game interact with one another in a meaningful way? Um, so that's kind of a nice section of this. It might not even belong in design motivations, but... I like that question a lot. One I might add to it, if, if you know, making my own chart is why does this game need to exist at all, right? How is it different enough from every other game on the market, right? How is it going to create a new experience? How is it like why why should this be a thing that I'm going to spend a ridiculous amount of time on 
that I'm going to put out into the world for people to tear it apart, right? So like, you got to think through. So why should this exist? If I'm just creating another generic Euro game that I'm just finding another random city, you know, in some random country, I'm like, oh, here's Brussels, the game. It's like, yeah, but why? Do I have something new to say? You know what I mean? Uh, or am I just rehashing a bunch of other stuff? Not that there's anything wrong with like taking mechanisms and ideas from other games, but like, what's the hook? What's the spin? Like, how is this different? You know? And so I think that's, that's one thing I'm always thinking about. Cause I don't want to just put out something where people are like, Oh, this is like this other game, except not as good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Cause there's lots of, lots of games out there. And I always think about like lots of products that exist in the world. Does it need to take up space or cut down some trees? You know, it's kind of like, at what point does it need to exist? So I like that. I have that, I think a marketing section that's at the very bottom because I don't want to do marketing up front because it kind of feels like it. I personally think it's like the, you know, that's more of like the actual nuts and bolts of how do you sell it. Um, so I, as you notice, I start very nebulous. And then hopefully by the end of this document, it becomes more like, you know, player count, time limit, that kind of thing. I like this other question you have in there. What excites you about the project? I think that's always something to remember. It's like, what made you want to design this in the first place, right? What seed of an idea was planted that you're like, ooh, that could be a game. And you could do this and you could do that. And that'd be kind of fun. And you could intersect this and, and this other thing. And like, what was that? Because sometimes either you haven't designed, you haven't worked on it for a while. So it's nice to come back and go, oh yeah, that was so cool. But also I think it's nice when you're in the grind of the 157th play test and you're just like, I am done with this game. <laughs> to have that written down as a reminder of why you're here, right? Uh, just to, because it's, what's, what's the old thing? I'm talking about like marriage. It's like, Marriage isn't a one-time event. Marriage is something you choose every day. Right? You have to choose to love your spouse daily. It's not one one time. Um, it's 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 ongoing thing. I think the same thing with game design and designing. It's like it's an ongoing thing where you have to look back and go, "Why am I doing this?" Because sometimes it's hard, and you get forty-seven rejections for this game you know is good, you know it's fun, but other companies aren't quite seeing it that yet. And so, just as a as a reminder to yourself to have something written down, you can go back and look at and go, "That's right." That's why I'm doing this, either for the game specifically or just as a designer in general. I think it's some, almost like a mission statement you put above your your, uh, your computer <laughs> or something like that, right? Cat. <laughs> yeah, but but something more specific though, like that really dives into the heart of like the core of why you're doing this. You know, to always come back to on those days when you you know you've gotten your fiftieth rejection letter in a row or a playtest just went off the rails and you're like, wow, that was a dumpster fire. But just to have something written down you can look at and go, that's right, that's who I am. That's why I'm doing this. Let's get up. Let's keep going. I think it's just super helpful. I think that yours is very true and it's very motivating to see what excites you. I also will note on a darker side, um, if you're, this is earlier in the project when you're filling this out, if you just sit there and you can't think of a reason, it might be a good indicator of like, well, maybe I should just work on something else or, you know, you know not give it as much time as I would maybe other projects I'm more excited about. Um, Cause as you, many designers do, you might have a lot of different ideas and you're trying to, noodle on a lot of them. Um, and so this is also a nice stop of like, am I excited? Am I like truly excited about this project? Do I want to invest time and energy? Cause you could be doing so many other uh, design projects. It's kind of like which one, you know, pulls you the most. And so it's hard to fill out. That's also a great indicator. Yeah. That's a really good point. And also what you fill out, is it sustainable for the amount of time it's going to take to actually get this to, to bring this whole project to life, right? If you write down money, right? You see an opportunity in the market. We're like, hey, this is an idea that can make a lot of money. Hey, cool. Is that enough for you though? Like a lot of people, money alone is not enough to sustain you through 200 play tests. Like he's like, oh, unless it's a lot of money, which let me know your secret if that's the case, if you're designing games for a lot of money. Like we're all trying <laughs> well, to- Well, everyone gets into game design for money. We all know that. There's a huge, <laughs> <laughs> a huge amount of money you can make. Uh, Right. No, but That's I, why so many I mean, of us are also teachers because of all the lucrative sure. teaching opportunities out there. I have noticed that trend, teacher, game <laughs> designer. Random fun fact, my mother was a teacher, my sister's a teacher, my dad's a teacher. I'm not a teacher, but I'm a game designer, but it, it's basically the same. <laughs> if I wasn't designing games, I'd probably be a teacher. It's funny, man. And like, I was a teacher for several years, you know, while designing games. And I don't know, I think the schedule lends itself to that. Um, you have instant access to play testers. Like I was teaching high school kids. And so like they, they helped me play a lot of my games. Um, uh, you know, other teachers on campus were great for trying out games and bouncing around ideas. I don't know. I think it's just a, a profession that kind of lends itself to being able to design games. And also 
you're used to having to write things down. You're used to having to explain things to people, right? And so like a rules teach or a writing a rule book. Definitely overlap, I think. Uh, like you're presenting experience that hopefully gets them to learn something. But, but game design, it could be to, you know, different experience. Or I think also too, uh, fun teachers sometimes do game design without knowing it to introduce a lesson plan kind of thing. So yeah, I mean, if finding ways to gamify what you're teaching, right? So to get kids to, to learn uh, whether they want to or not, right? You trick them, you trick them into learning because they're having fun. They're like, oh, what are we doing? We're having fun, guys, as you learn algebra or whatever it is. Uh, it's just all kind of winds in there together. But let's, uh, let's move on to the next one, emotional details. Now, what in the world do you mean by emotional details? So a lot of people say when you design a game, like, what's the core mechanic? You go on board, board Game Geek and it's like, what's the core, you know, big mechanics in this game? Dice, you know, dice rolling, worker placement. Um, but I noticed when designing, what's your core emotion? Um, you don't have to pick just one, but it's like, how do the players feel? And I guess for me, this is really useful to list out early. Once again, just to keep Bob in mind, as you said, um, what do you want to make him feel? Because games, it's fascinating to me that you can use cardboard and make people have emotions through this cardboard you've <laughs> put together. Um, so is it supposed to be tension? Is it supposed to be like a race of like, oh, I got to hurry up. Is it a push your luck? emotion of like, ooh, I hope I don't uh, break. And typically, I will admit in this section, I typically write out blurbs like, ah, I'll type out, ah, or, or wow, that was clever. I'll just type out kind of like noodlings of kind of undertones of emotion through like little quotes, things like that. Or I might just type out scared, like I want them to be scared or tension or, or I want them to be cozy. I know that's a big thing with like games like Wingspan, things like that. It's like, I feel comfortable and kind of cozy while we just relax, play this game. Um, so yeah, it's just nice to have a core emotion in mind. I don't kind of like with mechanics, I don't know if every game needs so many layers of all these different conflicting emotions. It might just be nice just to have a game that makes you feel connected, um, or have a game that makes you feel tense or, you know, kind of just nice to have a, just one to go for. As game designers and writers and anyone dealing with these kinds of mediums, we're, we're handling magic in a lot of ways, right? Stephen King talks about this a good bit. He, he has an excellent book about writing, but he talks about the magic of being able to write down a sentence. And then that sentence goes out into the world somewhere else. And someone else who he's never met before reads that sentence that he wrote. And then they have a picture in their mind of what it is. Now, is that picture in their mind exactly the picture in Stephen King's mind? Probably not. Picture in his mind, probably a lot scarier. But uh, this idea <laughs> that we're able to transport an idea, transport a moment, transport a story from where I am here in middle of nowhere, Alabama, that I could do that, you know, to someone in middle of nowhere, Europe or Australia or Africa or wherever, that's magic. Like that's a miracle that our brains have the ability to do these things. Right. And so to kind of lean into that and like, how am I going to provide these really cool experiences, these really cool moments in this magical kind of way to create memories that people have that, that I've never met, right? I'm never going to see these people. They're never going to be able to tell me about it, but I'm helping to make memories in their own lives and their, with their family and friends. And because that's another thing to think about. It's like people talk, they don't, they don't talk mechanically typically, right? If, if I'm playing a game and I'm rem remembering what happened, I don't say, oh, Leo, hey man, remember, remember that time I rolled two dice and you rolled four <laughs> dice and I moved some green cubes and you moved some blue cubes. Wasn't that cool? Like, no, it's, hey, remember that time where my army was outnumbered two to one. And then they, we found a way to overcome and, and you were trying to take over my country, but I didn't do it. I, I pushed you out and I ended up taking over your country. Like that's how we talk. We talk as, as like real terms, right? And to think through how can you create those moments for people to have those memories and to share those, like those stories in interesting ways. I don't know. It's just fun to like think about that and then turn it into reality. That's exactly one of the, I think it's the third question now. It's like, what memories will players share about your game? Cause I do the same thing. It's like, Oh man, we we almost we we almost got on this time. It was a co-op game, or oh, we get so close every time, and it, I want to play again, but we're gonna lose again. Or it's kind of like I said, like saying it out loud. That's why I kind of type typically write it stream of consciousness in this section because people don't talk like I felt scared playing that game. Like they they might say like, oh, remember that time? It was kind of creepy, and like we almost you know like I I couldn't know if you were the killer or not. I didn't know, and then there's this kind of big moment. So. Once again, a little nebulous, but I find it really useful just to try to tag a key moment. And I actually even have a printout of like a feelings list. You know, there's like that, like emotion wheel. You can go online and type in emotion wheel. Sometimes if you want to get inspired to just design a game emotion first, that can be fun. Just pick a, let's see, 
is there a good game that could make someone feel grateful? I don't know. It's an interesting prompt. Um, so it's kind of fun to start there sometimes. Yeah, for sure. Uh, reminded of the original Pandemic Legacy, Pandemic Legacy Season 1 by Matt Leacock and Rob Davio. And to hear them talk about it, because there's this, I don't remember which month of the year, because the idea is that you play through 12 months, January through December, 12 sessions of the game is kind of the idea. And one of the months, there's a big twist. And I can't remember which month. I'm just going to say September, right? But there are people that will walk up to Matt or Rob and just like look at him and go, September freaking <laughs> September. It's just like, it's this realization. Of, and and they know what happened in this experience and this memory that was created around the table. And they only have to use one word to do it. And like, that's, that's such a cool thing. And you can design for that, right? Uh, even if you're designing mechanical abstract games, you have those moments where people look at, uh, look at you and go, huh, that, that thing that you did, hmm, caused some dissent in my house <laughs> between me and my spouse, you know, like whatever it is. That's what I love about the, the risk, um, strike game is like, man, we still, f this game makes us fight just as much as the other risk does. I'm like, cool. That's, that's what we're going for. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That same experience, but in a, in streamlined, I like the way you said it, an espresso shot of risk. I think that's a good way to say it. All right, moving to the next one, we got player types. And now this seems to be the, um, the player types from magic, the gathering. Is that right? Yep. And so this is a perfect example of how I will, as I learn things, I'll just like, Hey, that's useful. Let me keep that in mind and I'll copy and paste it. So this is from Mark Rosewater. It's just the like Timmy, Jimmy spike, uh, framework, which is like, think of these archetype players and how they'll deal with your game. Um, and so we don't have to go deep on that, but it's a really cool resource and I found it useful. So I just put it in my pillars of design, uh, just to see, just to be like, Oh yeah. In my brain, Keep in mind, people want to be, you know, they want to have an experience or maybe they want to express themselves or maybe they want to compete. Um, how does your game work in that framework? And so it's just kind of a quick pulse check of keep these three player types in mind and think how that changes your design decisions. Right. Also, how can you make sure you're playtesting with these people in mind? Because if you, if you don't have one of these types in your group, then you got to do it superficially because they're, these people exist, right? And so there's going to be a certain percentage of people that play your game that don't care about winning, that only want to do stuff that's cool. Okay, well, how do you design with that in mind? There's some people that, that don't care about anything cool. They're just trying to min-max everything to get the most victory points to win the game. Okay, well, let's think about the game from their perspective. Uh, Rob Davio, recently in a podcast I did with him, he talked about how he assigns color, like, if, you know, you get the red player and the blue player, player, the purple, whatever. He will assign a player type to that color as he's playtesting, especially if he's by himself. You know, so he's going to be the red player for this round. Okay, well, the red player, you know, wants to do cool combos and wants to, like, really push the game uh, limits, right? See what happens. Not so much worried about winning. Okay, blue over here, min-maxing everything, going to try to win. Purple over here doesn't want to win. Uh, she just wants you to lose. So she's going to do everything <laughs> to kind of troll you and mess with you and, like, put you know, push you in different directions. Um, but assigning color, that makes it easier to kind of keep in, in your head as a designer, like, what you're doing and just remember, right? But even... Even if you go to a playtest night, you can say, hey, uh, okay, can you help me out by playing the game this way, right? Especially if you don't have those certain types that you're really trying to stress test the game for. Um, I think that's a cool way cool way to do it. And just, again, keeping these kinds of people in mind. I will give a quick shout out to a thanks of the Austin Board Game Design Group. They have lots of different variety of people. And so I'm lucky enough to have an outlet that we have a couple of min maxers. We have a couple people who want to like, I'm personally the kind of person who just, I just want to play and experience it. Of course, if you can't tell by this talk, I, I just want to feel the game and try to experiment. And then of course we have our, you know, min maxers. And so it's really nice to have those in mind. Um, but once again, maybe your game, you intentionally don't mind if it's not that, you know, if you can't express yourself, maybe it doesn't need that many layers. Um, but yeah, there's a fun little pit stop on the way on this list of like, oh, just keep those guys in mind, see how it looks through those lenses. Well, also from a bigger perspective, as far as this document is concerned and anyone wanting to make a document like this, to realize it's a living document. You're going to change it. It's going to ebb and flow. You're going to add to it. You're going to take away depending on where you're at and your design level and skills and things that you're learning and things like that. And, you know, books that you read, podcasts you listen to, you're like, oh, that's cool. Let me add this question in there. That's the point. That's right. To continue this document to help you become a better designer, making better games it definitely has gotten uh, a little bloated over the years but i mean it's useful information i don't want to delete but ultimately it started off i think with like three sections and now it's at like 12 so yeah but also not feeling like you have to answer every single question no, like it's just yeah. it's something to help you it's a tool in your toolbox right not something that you have to have as a crutch but something that you can 
you know, help you along in your, your process. All right. The next one, story details, right? So some of the things we've talked about uh, a little bit before. So tell me, tell me why these things are here and how they're maybe a little bit different from some of the other sections. Sure. So before it was all about like, what's the moments you want to create the, you know, who you're going for. This is now actually getting to the nitty gritty of like, what is the narrative arc of your game play? Um, like, what are the characters in your game? Who are the players playing as or who, what, why kind of thing? So it's like um, using the, let's say the roller coaster game, for example, you, just defining like your, you as a player will be taking control of a company, uh, a person building roller coasters, who are you, you know? And then how is your narrative art going to change throughout the game? And so it's kind of just thinking very much like a movie script, the whole like either hero's journey or just like, how does it end narratively? Does it end with the, the park is built and you're satisfied because the park is finished and you as the designer have the most points. Um, so it's just kind of now getting into like going from high concept to like, okay, the game actually has beat. I, I like to think in act three acts, like act one, set up, figuring out your game, making a strategy, act two, you know, we're in the middle of the game. How is it tense? And what is it? Why do you kind of have that momentum? And then act three is like, ah, it's close, but how did I win? Uh, how does the story resolve itself? Um, and not every game has to be this narrative epic. Uh, even like simple games, I feel like have a, a pretty like nice narrative, like the whole risk strike example. Um, you, you start building your continents, you decide the sets you want to collect. You have a couple of battles it escalates by one player becoming kind of more in control. Everyone kind of tries to team up to take them down. There's this like last minute of like, do they rush to take it and win? Or is it like power is quickly swapped and distributed? Um, not, I wouldn't say a great movie, but has the beats, I think, of progression. Yeah. It can also help from a design standpoint of thinking, okay, in act two, I want these kinds of things to happen, right? So does that mean new things become available? Maybe new, you know, piles of tokens or piles of cars, whatever. Now those are open and, and players can start leaning into that. If you think about games that kind of you set up a deck where you have level one, level two, level three enemies or something like that, you again, you're thinking through the, the act structure and how the game's going to play out over a certain amount of time. Um, one, it could be mechanical because you don't want a level one player fighting a level 10 monster that's just going to destroy them, right? That's not fun. So you want the players to level up as the monsters level up. So anyway, there's lots of reasons you can think about that both mechanically and just narratively. But um, yeah, it makes a lot of sense to be thinking about those things because the players are going to experience it in those those ways. The two quick takeaways is just, I find the most two useful questions in this section is who are you? That's a nice one. And then also, how are you? How do you change? Because every good story has character development or change. You're like, oh, I start off as the grumpy old man. By the end of the movie, I, you know, I'm in love with this dog I found. <laughs> uh, so I think of that. Like, it doesn't have to be exactly always that, but like, how will the players have their, their, their story? How will they change? Um, so it's something I keep in mind. All right. The next one, a little more self-explanatory mechanical details. Okay. We're talking player count. We're talking difficulty, uh, the game length, the specific mechanisms in there. So, I mean, that, that's kind of stuff people would expect from a document like this, but anything you want to add or really highlight as far as the mechanics? Um, no, kind of like many of these other podcasts, there's lots of great advice on like, you know, how many, how many players do you want? It's really useful to have up front kind of your nuts and bolts. And one I do like on here is uh, difficulty to learn the rules. I think of BGG a lot of like the weight, like, oh, how, what is the like weight of this game? And, and mostly not from the whole game, because I find that a little hard to visualize how the whole game is going to be complex or not, but just like learning the rules. How's that on ramping going to be? Is it, do you want it fast? Do you want it like, do you don't mind it being a little longer because the game is worth that? Um, I find that probably one of the most slightly different questions in here, but everything else is pretty standard. Um, core mechanics that you want, you know, difficulty to learn the rules, gameplay length, that kind of thing. Yeah, definitely. The next one though, is something I think more designers need to be aware of as far as gameplay details. And one, a couple that really stand out are how much luck versus skill is in the game. Cause that is a lever you really have to pay attention to as a designer. How long is this game? If it's a two hour game, you, you got to limit how much luck is in the game, right? Cause if I have a bunch of bad die rolls that destroy me early, and there's no way for me to catch up because the dice, right? Not because of any decisions I made. And so now I've just got to sit there for the last 45 minutes and kind of play out this thing. And I already know how it's going to end. That's not super fun, right? So thinking through that. Um, also, what were what are players going to do on, excuse me, why will other players care when it's not their turn? I think that's another thing to think about. What's the downtime like? Because a lot of times we, we're so excited and you give players these cool combos. And they can do all these things on their turn. Yeah, and then their turn takes 15 minutes. And so everybody else at the table is like gotten up, they're making a sandwich, they're checking the, the weather. Like 
Okay, that doesn't create a good experience. So some things to think about. What else really stands out to you in uh, in this section? Um, of course, there's the classic, what choices will the players make? Um, but I, I, I agree. I think the luck and skill one are fun just because, you know, uh, we, we typically work with mass market and mass market likes a little more luck, uh, we found. Um, of course, gamer hobbyists like a little more, you know, they control the game. So I'm just thinking of that lever and how that works. Um, what interactions will the players have is probably one of my favorites. Because once again, one of my missions is like, if I'm designing a board game, I want people to be there face to face. I think interaction's a must for me. I think it's like, that's the reason I like playing board games is I get to look at my friend and be like, either, hey, we did it, good job, high five, or I'm totally winning, uh, you're not gonna catch up. Either way, there's that moment of connection. Um, so interactions through the gameplay is important to, to think of. Um, just like, will the players have light interaction? Will they maybe, even this is not a mechanic, but will they even just like cozy talk to each other while their turns are not going? Like, you know, it's okay for games not always to have this take that, or as long as you just keep that in mind, it's a nice, you know, once again, just something nice to jog your memory of like interactions important. Uh, can you design for it? Or is it just a thing that's going to happen that you can't control? Definitely. And also just to help you be intentional, right? If this is the game you're trying to design, well, let's write that down and then be intentional about how we're going to make that happen. Makes a lot of sense. All right. Next couple ones really get more into the business side of things. we got visual details and then we'll get into marketing details. So tell me your, your thought process as a designer. You're not a publisher, right? You're reaching out to other companies. You, know, you have you and your design studio, two of your friends that you're kind of making games and then pitching to some pretty good companies, right? Uh, but you're not doing it yourself. So tell me about why, why do you have these more business side of things in this document versus just letting you know, letting those companies figure it out themselves. So, um, I mean, yeah, we like to pitch to publishers because we like to, you know, we started off and we're like, oh, we just want to be game designers. And so we're going to pitch, let the publisher do most of the business. But I mean, we've, we've found that, you know, if you can speak the language of a publisher and you already have thought through a couple of things, it goes a long way. Um, as far as I think them just being responsive to you of like, oh, they know what they're talking about. They've, they've thought of us, for example, with like, you know, the Clue series we did. We did a lot of research on Clue. We thought as well as they did as far as like, how would it market? Will escape rooms be palatable to your average, you know, Bob? <laughs> Will Bob want to play our escape room? What does he think an escape room is? Um, that kind of stuff is just useful for us to not only help connect with the publisher and do a little bit of legwork, but also design with intention. Once again, um, help filter your decisions. Um, so a good example is we, we thought early, the escape room game, um, is it? Is it going to be a card based system, like kind of like exit or something like that, where you just have to, you know, there's these games that like come and there's like, everything is available to you. You open the packet, there's these documents and you have to solve it, but that has a pretty high, like you have to take everything, read it all. So can you market it to like, you know, average Bob, we need to make it like a, you know, like a board game because he knows what a board game is like a move to this spot that would connect more. And so anyway, just thinking with the publisher kind of alongside them has been really useful for us. Right. As far as visual details, what kind of artwork is necessary? How many assets are you going to need? You know, how many miniatures, if you need miniatures, can you use wooden, you know, pawns instead? Do you really need a plastic mini? Like, is that really vital to the game experience? Does it make it more of a toy? Like all those different things to think about, because that's exactly what the publisher is going to be thinking about. Maybe like right after thinking about the idea, they're like, wait, how much is it going to cost to manufacture? Right. So like, if you're going to sell it, that you have to think ahead with them because otherwise you've, you've done all this work and then you realize, oh yeah, I sent that thing off. It cost me a lot of money to send to the publisher and time. And I only got really one shot to show them. And I forgot that all these pieces cost so much money <laughs> like, and they kind of are turned off to that. So the, the, the more, the basically the less load you can take off the publisher, the more likely, hopefully they'll hear you out and maybe move on with your product or your concept. Yeah, that makes sense. And then going into the marketing side, you know, again, to design with intention, to design thinking about how we're going to market it, what, what's the hook going to be, what's going to draw players in, what's going to look good on Instagram, all those things. That just makes everything makes everything easier to design because then you can get focused, right? But also trying to think through why, right? If, especially if you're going to pitch this either way, right? Either you're pitching to publishers and then they're going to pitch it to consumers or you're a publisher going to pitch it to consumers. Either way, you're pitching to consumers. It's just a matter of like how far removed are you, right? And saying, thinking through, why should they care, right? This is an investment. 
It's an investment of time and money. And what's the return on that investment going to be, right? That's really what marketing is. It's, it's letting people know that however much money and time they put into this product, that they're going to get a return out of it that's going to be worth it. It's going to be more valuable than whatever you put in, right? It's, it's simple ROI in a lot of ways. And that's what marketing, that's what you're trying to do. That's what a Kickstarter campaign page is, right? The people that go there, they're going to back your game. 99.999% of those people have never played it unless they were in your little group of playtesters, but you should be giving those people free games anyway, so they shouldn't be backing your campaign unless it's for a dollar, <laughs> right? But, you know, mo for the most part, people are seeing a thing that you're trying to convince them is going to be worth whatever the cost is. Same thing pitching to a publisher, right? You're saying, here's our idea. Here's the game. Here's how it plays. It is a worthy investment that you are going to get a return on, and then we want X percent of that return. So thinking that, and it's bare bones, right? So when you have those things written down, right? The price point, the hook, the, the, the demographic of people that would be interested in this game, how much money that demographic of people have, right? So if you're, this is why designing kids games is, can be smart because you're designing games, not for kids, but for parents to buy, right? And uncles and grandparents, right? Thinking through that, right? It's not the kid that's going to see it on the shelf necessarily, it's grandma who's walking through the store looking for a birthday gift. And she's like, oh, that looks interesting. Yeah, I think little Susie would love this. So thinking through that. So anyway, that's, that's kind of where my, my mind goes with the marketing things. What are some of the other things you're thinking about? You got a lot of, this is one of the bigger sections. You got a lot of stuff going on sure, on this one. Yeah, so tell me some of the highlights. So I think just a real quick overview, I think marketing also, if you can fill this out, it also helps you with your pitch to the publisher. Because you basically have a blueprint for how you want to pitch it. It's a, it's a, this game, but there's a hook, but also it's, it, it's going to be this much, you know, to cost. And I imagine it's for this target audience. And I think they really like that. I mean, it just makes it easier um, to pitch helps you out kind of keep focused. Um, also, so executives aren't necessarily creatives. Right, right. right. Like so, they're not, they're not a game designer. They're just like, I mean, a lot of publishers are, but as you said, it's like, you're, you're, you need to speak the language of marketing so that the marketing team can get on board. Otherwise, I mean, I've been guilty of this where I've started a game pitch and I'm like, oh, but the, the mechanics are so cool. And it's just like, you know, it kind of goes over their heads and you're like, well, <laughs> it just helps kind of speak the lingo and put on different glasses and look at the game from different perspectives. Um, I would say there's a lot here, but I think the two I really like is pre-hook, which we've, we've probably talked a lot, but it's always good to reiterate, like, what's the wow factor? When you pitch your game, what is the like, oh, I'm interested. And usually it's, I found the formula is mostly something familiar and something unfamiliar. It's like, oh, you like, uh, you like Clue. Have you ever thought of a Clue escape room? Um, and so it's like, you know, I know what this is and what's that? And so that's the pre-hook. My favorite that I've re recently learned, I actually have to admit, is the post-hook. Um, what is after playing the game, people are going to be like, wow, I want to play that again. Or, oh, hey, um, Gabe, you got to play this game because there's either a mechanic or like, man, it had like, you, it felt like so crazy to play and they had this fun progression. And so just those two are nice um, to try to think of. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I like that post hook idea though, right? What are the story, and we talked about story already, but like, what are the stories people are going to tell? And then are, how, how are you going to get people to tell their friends about it, right? Because one th it's one thing to see a Facebook ad from a company that says, hey, buy this game. That's one thing. It's a whole other thing to see your friend who you trust post about a game and say, this is a great experience. Check out the pictures, check out the TikTok, whatever. Like, which one of those do you trust more? You know what I mean? And so how can you get people talking about your game in a way that's positive and gets other people to go, oh, that sounds interesting. Let me get a copy of that too. Or, hey, br make sure you bring that game to game night and let's let's check it out. I want to I I see it myself. How can you design with that in mind? And how can you pitch with that in mind? Either pitching to publishers or pitching to you know consumers on Kickstarter or wherever. Just think it through, right? All this plays into it. And a lot of times, honestly, when you see those games online that have a million dollars, right? They've made a million bucks on crowdfunding. And you're like, how in the world? It's because they've gotten this right. They figured it out. It's not because the game is amazing. Nobody's played it. It's on crowdfunding. It doesn't technically really exist yet, right? So what it means is they've done an excellent job at the marketing side of things as far as like getting people to look at the value, look at the cost, look at the investment, all these things. And for them to look at that entire equation and go, this is something I need to have. Okay, how do they do that? What did that look like? And then start breaking that down. Super helpful. So yeah, there's a lot going on. But I think the other one that's useful is what's the two sentence pitch? Um, you don't always have to fill that out. But if you filled out a lot of these other ones, you could probably 
you know, come up with one or oppositely, if you're just starting on a game and you're like, you know what, I'm going to start with the two sentence pitch first. Like you said, Eric Lang did the, it's Cthulhu, but you can shoot him in the face. That might be his pitch. And that also might be the inverted start with marketing, then design backwards. Um, but yeah, it's just fun to think about all these. And once again, I usually don't fill them all out, but it's nice to think of. No, I think that's one, especially maybe not right off the bat, but definitely like midway through the design process, you need to be able to fill that one out. I think it's, I think it's Einstein who said, if you can't explain something simply, then you don't understand it, right? So if you can't boil your, boil your game down into two sentences and it really explain what the game is, then you maybe don't quite understand the game you're making yet. Not that you won't eventually, but you need to be able to, it's that elevator pitch thing, right? Where you can kind of concisely put the game into a handful of words and get people to go, oh, that sounds interesting. Tell me more. Or I want to play that, right? And so I think that's, that's super important. Right. Also, too, something I've learned from the prototype group here is um, actually testing your pitch out. Like you test your game, you test your game all the time. So why not go around and tell your friends your two sentence pitch, just see their face. Do they go, oh, that's kind of cool. Or do they go, sweet. <laughs> like, you know, it's kind of a, it's a subtle thing, but it's easy to say two sentences to somebody to see if they resonate with it. It's like you can play test your pitch. Um, it also kind of, you know, play test is your, your game hook and you can always kind of change that as you go. Yeah, absolutely. All right, coming into the last one here, design outlets. So what do you mean? So this is, we were talking about this earlier before, but it was just like the outlets I found really dictate what I design. Uh, so for example, we have our foot in the door with Hasbro and that's great. And I love that relationship. And so I want to keep pitching to them, but they're definitely an outlet that I have in mind when I design, like it's mass market. They're looking for certain types of games for a certain type of audience. And so it's nice to just think of what is your design outlets? Like I have a play test group that we can play usually for about an hour. So does that, is that dictating my kind of like this game needs to be about an hour? Um, where can you get feedback? I think it's for myself, it's really crucial to have the energy kind of like, here's a game, I share it, I get feedback. Um, as you always say, like keep play testing is very crucial. So it's more just taking stock of where you're, where are you play testing? Who are you playing with? How is that going to kind of, how can you set that up for this project? Um, so I'm making, an, I'm making an alien game. It's a space epic. Do I have friends that like aliens and want to play for two hours? If not, could I set this up? Um, what kind of feedback can I get from them? What do I need? It's kind of just a checklist of what you need to do next steps to have an outlet for your game or your project. And also hopefully helps you start thinking outside the box of, you know, I've got my normal playtest group that come, you know, we come together on Tuesday nights at 7 p.m. Okay, but this game, man, this game is kind of like magic. It's got some interesting magic elements to it. What what nights does uh, my friendly local game store run their magic tournaments? Okay, maybe I could go there like an hour early, hang out with some of the people there, like the OGs that love magic, and like maybe get their thoughts on this. Oh, that's interesting. Or what are some of the Facebook communities that you know play these kinds of games? Maybe I could get in with some of those and and see if some of those folks would want to hop on Tabletop Simulator and play this game. Like you start thinking outside your normal, you know, I'm trying to think the, the the stuff you normally do, right? And, and opening up to new ideas. And then all of a sudden the game gets better because you're pushing the limits of your playtesting in your design space. Yeah. You also get to meet new people and get new perspectives is always refreshing and inspiring when you get new, new playtesters. Um, but also, yeah, I guess what I was trying to say is both either go find new playtesters or recognize that you, like you said, you, you had only kind of like yourself. So you made a solo game and just recognizing that that's your kind of outlet um, is really useful because then it helps you once again, just make a choice. Should I make a five hour epic? I don't really have the group for it. Maybe not. <laughs> or I need to go find the group for it. Um, so that's just kind of what this is about. And there's there's a lot of random questions in here, but it's like mostly that's what it's about in the, in, in the whole thing. Yeah. Leaning into your situation to set yourself up for success. As you just alluded to, I got to a place in my designing where I didn't really have access to people. Then the pandemic was going on, like all these different things that just kind of push me more and more into solo design game, you know, design solo games. And I just went with it. You know, I didn't like be like, no, I'm going to design three hour euros, dadgummit. Like my situation, that, that would have been setting myself up for failure. Now, could I have found a way to do some different things? Yeah, maybe, probably if it had been that important, but I just found that I really enjoyed solo games. And so it's like, ah, let's just do this and let's, let's see what happens. So I think that's another thing is just not trying 
not trying to go against the grain too much, right? As a creative person, like see what gets you into flow, see what gets you into that design space and the exciting place, and then just lean, lean into it and go with it. If you don't have a group that can play three hour games, don't design three hour games. <laughs> it's just kind of that simple. Right? Basically, I like think I, I very much believe we're a product of our environment. So what environment are you in? Can you, you know, get to the table, that kind of thing? Yeah, definitely. I mean, this has been excellent. Any kind of like closing thoughts you want to leave people with? Like I said, I'll put the link to this document uh, in the show notes of the episode. And so if people want to check it out for themselves and, and you know, pull ideas from it, do it, you know, again, we're not saying, hey, here's your thing. It's going to fix everything. That's like, no, this is just an idea. Something that has worked that might work for you, you know, make it your own, figure it out. But what would be your your closing thoughts? Sure. Um, I think the only closing thought I had is just that uh, game design is a multi-class skill. So I know we talked about like uh, kind of emotions and trying to figure out target audiences and things like that. But just um, something I keep in mind for myself is just to try to experience new things and try to go out and gather new uh, kind of information, even if it is not always from the, the game design sphere or the playing game sphere, maybe go just try something random, kind of introduce some random notes and you never know what might happen. Yeah, absolutely. So I know Rush, excuse me, Risk Strike just came out. Um, and so tell me where people can find it, where they can find some of the other games. I guess most of your stuff sold in like Target and whatnot. So that's kind of nice. But anything else you want to tell people about? Of course. So um, we have a couple of Clue Escape Room games at Target, uh, Risk Strikes on Amazon Target. Um, what I would like to shout out to is there's a game called D&D, Dungeons & Dragons, Bedlam and Neverwinter. That is a escape room Dungeons & Dragons game uh, where you get to play as characters who are solving puzzles, but also combat. And also it's light enough to where you could play with your friends who are not, say, D&D experts. It's very much an on-ramping, kind of like my first D&D experience, but you get to solve puzzles. Um, really proud of that one, but yeah, thanks, Gabe. I mean, you guys can check out the games anywhere, but I appreciate you having me on and just letting me share my kind of huge document of, of nebulous ideas, but hopefully they're they're helpful to someone. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Really appreciate all this uh, excellent information. Cool. See ya. Thank you.